Yeah, it is on. Yeah. The HTML is not created by human hands. The HTML is created by programs. Of course, who creates those programs? Humans create that. So indirectly, it does. But this allows the ability for the web pages to be dynamic, that is, to change over time. So, for example, if you Google something, um, you get the results that match your query, what you typed in. Uh, without having to have a, 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 a billion web pages sitting out there waiting uh, to be pulled up. So, you know, you type in PHP, for example, in a search, and it brings up PHP and, and, and pages about that. So one of the, one of the big ways that, that pages are dynamic is that they take data that the user enters from forms, all right? And things like text boxes, you know, a search box on Google, uh, a, a form where you log in, where you enter in a user ID and password, uh, a form where you register for a website and supply your credentials, a form where you upload to a Dropbox like you do with your homework assignments. All those are examples of forms uh, in action that supply data to a server-side script, then the server-side script goes and does something with it. So the focus of this class is on the form, not on the server-side script. And we used an example from Bing uh, last time to show the basic mechanism of that. What I'd like to do is, is bring that up, back up a little bit, and then go on to some of the other form controls and why we use those other form controls. So, here we have a case where we can search for a certain string and we can actually put in a country code. And if you remember, we found that FR stands for France. And then we can go and do a search. And this will show us Yahoo searches focusing from pages from France. However, it defines that criteria. It's not immediately clear how it knows that the page is French or not. Uh, it, it seems a little dubious, but um, anyhow, it's trying to do that at the very least, all right? So, one thing that we do with forms is, if we, if we want to lay them out correctly, oftentimes what we do is we put the form in, as part of an unordered list, all right? Because really, what is a form? A form is a list of to send to a web server. So therefore, very often, we will make each one of these entries part of an unordered list. So we will go like this. Put our UL tag at the start and end. Create our LI for each of the individual items. And we'll get the elements of the form stacking vertically. And it will appear as a list. So we can go in and view it. Now our form looks like this. I think I put in an extra li. Yes, I did. or I put it in the wrong place, one of the two. All right. Now, again, we're using the markup to mark up what this really is. I mean, this really is a list of items that we want to send, so therefore a list tag is appropriate. 
Now, you might not want the bullet points next to it because this really isn't a bulleted, but we can do that. We can control that through CSS. So, because I'm lazy today, I'm going to put the CSS right in the page. It is typically best to use an external CSS file, but I can say ul list style type none, and that will give us this. Now, the one thing that I don't like about this, if we look at it, is that, pardon me? It's sort of squished, and, and we, can do, we can do things like that to improve it, to space it out a little bit and to style it. So we'll spend a few minutes doing this. All right, but the other thing I don't like is, is it would be nice if there was like a clean margin there. Like if all the text boxes aligned. If you can imagine if I had three or four more, they all align like that. Fortunately, there's a tag we can use that will help us with that that has another benefit as well. And that is an accessibility benefit. If I look at this web page, I can tell by, at a glance that search for is associated with that text box, right? Because it's next to it, the, the visual proximity of it, all right? Likewise, I can tell country. Likewise, if there's a whole bunch of other fields, I could tell that way. However, someone that can't see that the screen is being narrated, sometimes it's confusing when the screen is narrating it what a text box actually is, what it belongs to, and what you're supposed to put into it. All right? So there's a way, there's a tag called the label tag that allows us to associate um, a form element with the text that is the label for it. And what you do is something like this. Give your input field an ID. It can be the same as a name or different than a name, but it's not the name. It's a different field. I'll call it search. I'll call this country. And then what I can do is I can surround the text with a label tag and say label for equals, and then I put in the ID that this matches up for with. In this case, it's label for search. So now, this tag associates and screen readers can pick up and say, hey, if I'm in that text box, what is a label for it? Well, what has a label for search? That. So this is the text that we're searching for. Likewise, we can do a similar thing for country. And it doesn't make any visual difference to the page, but now the screen reader can associate the text that's the label with the, um, with the um, input box. All right? Go and open this guy up in Firefox. If in fact we have Firefox. Like we do. Alright, I guess we're stuck with Internet Explorer. Alright. Now some of the other uh, so but but that's a start that we can use for aligning up those text boxes. Because now what I can do is I can give the label tag
and I can give it a width. And now, those labels take up that width, and it's aligned. And I can do a little better than that even, all right? It'd be nice if the label was smack dab right alongside of it. So if I, if I write a line, the text inside of there, then I'm going to have the start of a real nice looking form. So I can say, in a label, I want the text align to be right. So now that is there. It's still kind of cramped, right? And how can I keep it from being cramped like that? Padding, yeah, or or um, margins and, uh, as well. So I can go and do a padding of five pixels, let's say. Let's look at the let's look at the button separately. Let's do a padding right of five pixels to put that space that way. Let's do on an LI a margin of three pixels. make it widely spaced so we can really see what's going on. All right, there we go. Now, what did you want to do with the button? Yeah. Well, how can we put the button in the middle? Okay, another idea for what? could for the button, or I could do it on the LI. So I could say ID equals button, and then up here I could say pound sign button, text align middle. Of course, that won't work because middle's not the right word. The right word is center. <laughs> yeah, that was a test. I'm glad you guys are paying attention. There we go. Oh, okay. Well, that's the And again, this is important to see because, for one thing, you might be tempted to put the ID on the button. I don't think that's going to do what we want it to do. Because if we do that, it's not centered. Well, it kind of is, except you got to remember, you, you center something inside the container, right? So if you want something centered inside the container, you put the center attribute on the container, not on the, uh, not, not on the thing that you want centered. So we actually want this here. So we do that, it's centered within the container. It doesn't look like it, but it is. But we could prove it to ourselves by putting in, say, a background color here. So if I make the background yellow and save it, we can see, yeah, it's, it's centered. All right. It's just that that LI is a lot wider than I thought it was. Well, how can we fix this? Well, just make the LIs narrower. So do something like LI with 300 pixels.
and then there we go. Um, I think I've mentioned it before, but it, it bears repeating. One good way to debug your code if it is not working the way that you would like it is to um, change colors. Like, for example, there I gave it yellow. Not that I wanted it permanently to be yellow, but it, it kind of helps you see what's going on. All right? Put borders on it, put colors on it, and, and, and that helps. Some of the other things you can do, one of the things you can do is run your CSS code through a validator. For example, if I would have put that code in there that said middle, through the validator, I'll bet you it would have told me that that was a problem. So if I go through the CSS validator and I put in my CSS code, but I say middle instead, which we found is incorrect, if I check it, sorry, we found the following errors. Text align middle is not a text align value. That's actually a fairly descriptive error, right? It tells me I can't put in middle for text align. So, hmm, middle, what should I put in there? I can then look it up and find out that it ought to be center. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, it would be nice, yeah, well, well, let's see what it does say. Does it give us a link? It gives us a link that doesn't work, uh-huh. Yeah, when you get it right, it does give you a nice little sticker. All right. Um, next thing. Um, we won't really see the benefit of this in this example, but... One thing that you can use is you can use a field set tag to group together form fields. And I have to look one thing up real quick. There's some new attributes here. It'll work because it, it, at worst it will ignore it, which means it might not be styled the way that we want it to, but if it can't figure something out, it ignores it. So what I can do is if these were grouped together, you know, um, these are all search items, right? So I could put a field set around these fields and I can put a legend that describes what they are what what this is these are all search items so I'll put search items And it puts a nice little box around it. It's also good for like conceptually linking things together. It's especially useful if you have like sections on your form. Um, for example, uh, and some of you may have, have in the past or, or, or currently filled out a FAFSA form, all right, for financial aid. That 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 form has 65 pages worth of data that you have to enter, all right. And each page has like five different sections. You know, there might be a section, for example, for student information, then student income, then student, I don't know, whatever. All right? But the point is, is that there's distinct sections to the form. Or if you bought something, if you ordered something online, there might be a billing address and a shipping address. And the billing address you can consider is like a group of fields that are logically connected and the shipping address are a group of fields. So you can put a field set around here. Um, in this particular example, 
doesn't hurt anything, but it doesn't really have value because this whole form um, is, is search information. So there isn't a second section of the form to have. But again, doesn't do any harm, looks good, so might as well go with it. All right. So that is styling and accessibility. In short, you can, do a, you can do most of the things that you can do to other CSS elements, you can do to form elements as well. Some of the input things get a little picky, and some attributes are harder to apply to some of the input, uh, input tags. Uh, but again, for the most part, you can style it uh, any way that you want. And we're on the start of having a nice form that is also accessible. But the one thing we observed last time is, in this, a text box isn't the best choice of country because there isn't, it's not like there is, you know, you can make up letters for countries. There's, there's a list of 200 or so defined countries and you have to pick one of them, all right? Now, some of the obvious ones are obvious, maybe. For example, what do you put in for the United States? You put in U.S. But, a person's liable to think that you put in USA instead of US or something else maybe, US of A or any, anything like that. So, it's good to have, instead of allowing someone simply to type that in, allow a list of choices, all right? And there's a couple ways that you can allow a list of choices. And one of them is with a drop down. So, let's go and let's make a drop down for country. And I'm not going to put a bunch of fields here. I'm just going to put um, a couple countries just so that we get an idea. A drop down is not done with an input tag, but it is instead done with a select. So the select goes around my list of options, right? And it says, hey, this field that I'm selecting here among a list of options, the name of it is VC, right? Remember, that's the name that the server-side script was expecting, so I have to have that. Then I still have my ID of country so that my label still works. Now what I can do is I can put a list of options. Now. It's probably obvious that FR means France, right? But is there another country in the world that starts with FR? There might be, all right? And you might get confused about, gee, is FR France or is FR, I don't know, frozen tundra or something, I don't know. So it's good to give the user a Expl uh, an explanation that they're really going to understand. In other words, FR, someone may or may not realize that that stands for France. Most people probably would, but some might not get it. Now, there's other countries that are going to be harder still, right? Well, you know, for example, UK. You know, does it say England or does it say UK? You know, so therefore, what I'm going to do is, with an option, I have the ability to put two things in. In the middle of the option tag is what the user is going to see. So the user will see as an option France. But the value sort of behind the scenes is going to be whatever that is. So think of this as the value is what the server side script is going to see. The text between the option tag is what the user is going to see. All right. So it's nice because then you know you can uh, you can make options that allows you to pick things in a way that's understandable for the user, but the script still gets the, na the data it needs. Let me give you a for instance. You know, here at LC, every faculty person has a faculty ID number. All right. Now, if there was a search to look for 
in the registration example, there's a search to look for classes that are taught by a particular faculty member. Or maybe even classes that are not taught by a particular faculty <laughs> member. All right, yeah, hmm. I'm not sure if they have both of those or just one of them. The point is, is, you know, are you going to know what my faculty ID number is? Of course not. All right. But the program that's going to go and do that search needs to know my faculty ID number, right? Because there could be, unlikely as it may sound, two faculty people that have the same names. All right. Actually, uh, in terms of last name, that probably isn't that uncommon. I, I know there were two brothers that taught here, one in one division, one in the other. So if you were just showing last name, that wouldn't be very effective. But even first name and last name, it's, it's at least conceivable that there could be two people that have the same name. So the name isn't going to be good enough. You need to know the faculty ID number so that you pick the right faculty person. But no student knows faculty ID numbers. They know faculty names. So in a drop-down, you could give the option, the text between the option, start and an option tag, would be the name, because that's what people are going to see. Whereas the instructor ID is going to be the value, because that's what the server-side script needs. So let's go and let's make a couple of these. And I'll make one for France, United States, United Kingdom, and so on down the line. All right. Three is about as many as is I have the patience to do today. All right. So now when we save this, notice that we go and look at it. We have a drop down then instead of text. So I don't have to worry about um, what the name is or what, what the code is. Is it FR or is it FRN or what is it? I simply just pick the one that I want and I can do a search and that search then works. Kind of. Okay, might not be the right one. Maybe maybe it is. But we'll get rid of it. I know these two work. There we go. Pages from France. Now, Notice that this defaults to France. Is that a good thing? Well, if this was a French website, if this was a website in France, then yeah, that might be a good thing. But if this is a web website in the United States or a website that was worldwide, that probably wouldn't be a good thing. So often what's done is you'll put a dummy choice at the top. A dropdown has to have a value, right? So if you don't pick a value, it's going to be the top value on the list. So if you want there to be a dummy value that says everything, you could just put a blank option at the top. That says all countries. And If you don't select any item, then it considers it to be all countries. So be careful with your defaults. Defaults are reasonable in some cases if that really is a value that you could assume. For example, let's say I, let's say I was doing a tuition calculator for students in Lorraine County Community College. All right. Now your tuition depends on how many credit hours you take and it also depends on whether you're an in-county student, uh, an in-state student, or an out-of-state student. 
all right? It would probably be reasonable to make the default for that Lorain County resident because I don't have the exact numbers, but I would assume statistically there are far more people that are Lorain County residents that are students here than people that are out of county or out of state. So it would be reasonable to assume that, all right? However, I wouldn't have a drop down for city, right? Because you can't really make any assumptions for the city of the students here, right? There's not one city that most students come from. You know, you have students from Lorraine, Elyria, Amherst, Vermillion, all through the line, all right? So you pick a default if it makes sense and if it's logical and if you can assume that the biggest percentage of your people um, are, are going to make that choice anyhow. Otherwise, you can do what I did and sort of put a dummy option at the beginning and, and force the user to pick. Um, that. Another option for this is radio buttons. I'm going to do the same thing I did with the drop down except I'm going to do it with radio buttons. Notice I have now a type of radio instead of a type of um, text like I did for the text box. Um, the value is FR. In other words, if this is a radio button chosen, this, the value behind it will be FR. And then lastly, I have a name. Now, just to show you the radio button work, I'm going to change this one to VC. All right. Now, I can go and repeat that radio button over and over, but the one thing I want to keep the same is the name. So for USA, I can go... and so on. The name part is what makes it a radio button. And what do I mean by a radio button? I mean that only one of them can be selected. If I change my selection, it unselects everything else. So if I go and save this, my radio button now, I have one for France, United States, and Canada. By default, none of them are selected. That's a little different than with the drop-down. With the drop-down, there's always going to be one that's selected. All right. With a radio button, not necessarily one of them will be selected. But as I go in and check each one, the other ones get turned off. So I can't pick more than one choice here. Yes, but it would be done via JavaScript. All right. Although there are some new HTML5 attributes that, that help with that as well. Now, if I were to get the name of this wrong, if I would just, if I typoed on Canada, for example, 
on the name of it and made the name V instead of VC. It wouldn't then act like a radio button because I could click on France and click on Canada and both of them are checked. And I shouldn't be able to do that, right, with a radio button. With a radio button, it's implied that there's only one selection. So the name is what ties them together, not where they're located on the screen or anything like that. All right. So I could have a second set of radio buttons, you know, maybe for um, language, all right, but that second set of radio buttons would all have its own name, all right. It's the name what ties, that ties the radio buttons together. Now notice that both the drop down by default and the radio buttons only allow you to select one entry, all right. Now that may or may not be accurate in this particular case, right? If I was searching for web pages, I might want to pick web pages from a couple different countries. For example, if I wanted to pick uh, a set of web pages from the North American countries, I might want to pick United States, Canada, and Mexico. All right? In which case, a drop down or a radio button wouldn't be good because those only allow me to pick one. You actually can configure a drop down to pick more than one, but that sometimes confuses users. So we'll, the default is that a, a drop down only allows you to pick one entry. What allows you to pick multiple entries are checkboxes. All right? Checkboxes work like this. And again, this, this isn't going to work with the server-side script because at this point I'm just sort of making stuff up for this. And I don't care if the server can handle it or not. And I now have the ability to check multiple of these. That's different than this where I can only have one selected at a time. So when you're determining, when you're looking at a form, a good portion of the form is to decide like what form controls you need. What's the most appropriate thing for uh, your form control. Now for your, your assignment that deals with creating a form, keep in mind I have a little table in the middle of the page of the assignment. That doesn't mean that your form should look like that. That's a description of what should be in the form. But based on the, uh, the, the particular thing that you're choosing on the form, you should decide, does it need to be a text box? Does it need to be a radio button? Does it need to be a drop down? Does it need to be check boxes? The difference between the checkbox and the radio button, or the checkbox and the drop down, are obvious. The checkbox allows multiple selections. So there's probably something on the pizza example where you would want to allow the user to select multiple things. But there's probably some other things for the pizza example where the user has to select for one pizza, has to select one thing. All right. Now, what's it? Go ahead. Did you have a question? I believe you can set a tab order in, in, uh, in the form controls. Yeah, in the HTML. But by default, it's going to like follow a logical order anyhow. Yeah. Yeah, by default, it takes it through the order that you would expect it to. All right. Yes. Repeat the question. Right. No. 
Are there any other questions? No. Uh, <laughs> let's go back and answer why. The reason is this. It, with a checkbox, I can check it or uncheck it. With a radio button, if I gave each radio button a different name, I could check the radio button, but I could never uncheck it then. Because you can't uncheck a radio button. You can only check another radio button. So if I were to go in here and give each of these radio buttons different names, yeah, I could go in and check France, and I could go and check United States, but oh, never mind, I don't want the French web pages. Haha, <laughs> too bad you're stuck with them. All right. Because again, you can't uncheck a radio button. The way that you uncheck a radio button is by checking another radio button in that group. And if each one is the only one in this group, then you're out of luck. Yes? That is a good question, and I'm sure it would probably depend on the particular screen reader. I, I can't, I don't know an answer the, to that. Um, you could probably, I mean, you can, you can tab through it, I, or you can arrow through it, I believe. That would be my guess, but I, I have to say I don't know for sure. Um, there's a few things that you can do with this um, if you have a long list. One is, and they kind of half contradict each other, you, so you have to just look at your data. Um, one is that you put the most common ones on the top and put the less common ones uh, on the bottom. So for example, if I was doing this, I might put the larger countries at the top, you know, the ones I would expect, United States, you know, and so on down the line. United States, China, you know, and so on. Um, the other way to do it would be to do it in alphabetical order. That way, you know, it's logical. And with alphabetical order, this only works for the first letter, but if I type in a letter, I go to that. I don't have the advantage of being able to like, type FR and it will go to the FRs like you can in, like, in a Visual Basic program or something. But again, I could at least hit F. So if I had a real long list and I was accessing this for, through the screen reader, and if it was in alphabetical order, I could hit U to go to the U's, and then arrow down to find United States or Uzbekistan or whatever. Yes? Is France first because you put it first in the code? Yeah, France is first just because I put it first in the code. You can control the order, right. <clears throat> so again, you, you'll look, if you look at web pages, you'll see both strategies being adopted. Sometimes they put the ones that are most common at the top. Sometimes they put them in, in purely alphabetical order. You know, so again, just depends on the strategy they take. Now, what's the difference between a drop-down and radio buttons? Because they both sort of behave the same way. And if we look, like if I pick something here and do a search, notice that oops, Notice that on the query string, we always get the code. We don't get the name. All right, remember, that's what the script needs in the background. Um, but at any rate, what's the difference between a drop-down and a radio button? Because they both only allow you to make one selection. Yeah, real estate, all right? Um, in this case, because I only have three options, they sort of take up about the same space, right? Maybe the radio buttons take up a bit more, but essentially they take up the same space. With radio buttons, you have the advantage that you can see all the options all at once, all right? With a drop-down, you have to click it and sort of explore it to see the options. On the other hand, if there's hundreds of options, all right, it's probably better to have them in a drop-down. So 
Yeah, they can be used interchangeably, but there are some sort there are there are some guidelines, you know. Um, you would you would not use radio buttons if you had a lot of entries. Other than that, if you have a few entries, then it's kind of your call, you know. Would is a better radio button or you know I can't conclusively say. That's true. The, the Likert scale where it says this. Do you strongly agree, disagree? That, I think, is good because it sort of helps people visualize it. So you can see, you know, which end of the scale you're on, I think, better. So, yeah, that would be a case where I would say a radio button probably would be a better choice. But I, I guess that's my point. You look at it and say, does it make sense? If I had a yes or no question, what are different ways that I could represent it? I have a radio button, all right, with two options, yes or no. I could have a drop down with two options, yes or no. Could I use a checkbox? <laughs> well, why not? Well, because they can yes and no. Well, that's the trick. I wouldn't have two checkboxes. I'd have one checkbox that says, do you agree with the statement? So. Like, let's say, do you agree with the terms and conditions of this website? All right. I could have a drop down that said yes or no. I could have radio buttons that could say yes or no. Or I could have a checkbox that says yes. And if it's unchecked, it means no. All right. So, again, a yes or no question you can actually represent with all three of these. All right. We have a few more loose ends to wrap up with this. Uh, I would urge you to read the book. Again, I don't think it's my responsibility to read you every page of the book. All right. So do read the chapter on forms in the book, but we do have a handful of loose ends to pick up and useful form controls and, and so on. Uh, and we'll polish that up on Monday. Any questions? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Correct. Exactly. I could I could make an embedded list, a, a nested list, if I wanted to to show it that way. All right. Probably would be better in this case, but yeah, I, I did not do that. All right. Fair enough. All right. Other questions. What do you mean it was just a blank thing? Uh huh. Oh, uh, above it, yeah. I, I believe in. We can double check in lab, but sometimes I have the the text of the assignment in the Dropbox. This time there's a separate document because it's a, it's a longer explanation. So if you look above the Dropbox, it should say instructions for lab. 10 or whatever lab it is. Yeah. All right. See you up in lab.